French roll means to be administered by injection. There are four common methods by which drugs are administered parenterally. They are interdermal, subcutaneous, intermuscular, and intravenous. Parenteral administration of drugs includes all forms of drug injected into a body tissue or fluids using a syringe, needle, or catheter. Drugs given parenterally must be sterile, soluble, absorbable, and relatively non-irritating. Parenteral administration can be the most hazardous route by which a drug is given. Perhaps you've heard of something called guru theory. It states that to become truly proficient in something, it takes about five years. This has been proven over and over again with athletes, surgeons, artists, or really anybody that's good at doing something. Starting an IV is no different. It takes time and practice. By the end of this video, you'll understand IV basics and even have a few helpful hints to help you becoming an IV guru. Once the decision has been made to use intravenous iodinated contrast media for a particular examination, the method of injecting iodinated contrast media will vary depending on vascular access, the type of examination, and the specific clinical indications for the examination. These factors will determine whether the injection will be performed by hand or with the use of a mechanical injector or power injector. They will also influence the contrast volume used, the flow rate at which the contrast will be injected, the delay between injection and scanning, and whether a saline flush is beneficial. Stable intravenous or IV access is necessary for contrast media administration. In many instances, the IV line must be placed while the patient is in the medical imaging department. In other instances, the patient arrives in the department with IV access already started. In addition to standard indwelling peripheral catheters such as the angiocath, patients may arrive with central venous access devices. Although central venous access devices such as the PIC are not optimal for contrast administration, in some cases they are the only option available. Therefore, a medical imaging professional must have a working knowledge of the different types of central venous access devices, including when and how they are to be administered with contrast media. Please make sure you have a good understanding of central venous access devices that are highlighted within the text. Today's presentation will be studying the peripheral venous line, or standard IV, also referred to as the standard indwelling peripheral catheter. Starting an IV requires a venipuncture technique in which a needle is inserted into a vein. Before beginning the process, the basic consent of the patient is obtained by explaining the procedure and asking whether the patient consents. Aseptic technique must be observed for all intravenous procedures. For the protection of the patient and the healthcare worker, standard precautions must be strictly adhered to. An indwelling catheter set with a flexible pat plastic cannula should be used whenever a mechanical injector will be used for contrast media injection. The use of metal needles, such as a butterfly, should be avoided in conjunction with mechanical power injectors as they may contribute to contrast media extravasation and patient injury. Whenever possible, catheters and other ancillary components in the contrast fluid path to the patient should be specifically designed for the capability or have the pressure and flow rate capability with the parameters that will be programmed for the power injection. An indwelling catheter set typically consists of a plastic catheter and a hub, a beveled needle and a hub, and a beveled position indicator and a flashback visualization chamber. The visualization chamber may contain a reverse spring-loaded automatic retractable needle. Regardless of the particular brand of indwelling catheter, the basic design is the same. You have a metal needle 
ranging in gauge from 25 to 14 that has a tight-fitting plastic catheter placed over it. The catheter is slightly shorter than the needle so that a short segment of the needle protrudes beyond the catheter, allowing penetration through the skin. Let's take a moment to look at the specific steps required for establishing an indwelling peripheral catheter. First, get your supplies ready. Collect the needed supplies before beginning the venipuncture, including a tourniquet, tape, sterile gauze, a small cotton ball, saline, most likely in a syringe, disposable gloves, and applications for preparation of the insertion area. IV start kits available that usually include all of these items. Choose the gauge of IV indwelling catheter. The anticipated flow rate of contrast injection should be appropriate for the gauge of catheter used. Although 22 gauge catheters may be able to tolerate flow rates up to 5 milliliters a second, a 20 gauge or larger catheter is preferred for flow rates of 3 milliliters a second or higher. Select two different gauges of catheter, usually a 22 and a 20 to make it easier to adapt to the size of the peripheral vein chosen. After arranging the IV supplies, interview the patient to once again verify their identity and to answer any additional questions they may have. Choosing the site. The superficial venous anatomy of the upper extremity allows for many choices of a particular vein in which you can find a suitable location to start an IV. The antecubital or large forearm vein is preferred venous access site when a power injector is used. However, if the patient will be required to lift arms for scanning, it is important that the patient is able to keep the arm straight while above the head. Bending the IV site may kink the IV line, causing it to fail during the injection of contrast. If a more peripheral site, such as a hand or wrist, is used, with a smaller gauge catheter, it may be necessary to limit your flow rate to two milliliters per second or less. Placement of the needle. After assembling your supplies, verifying the patient's identity, and selecting the site, venipuncture can be initiated. Apply a tourniquet about two inches proximal to the chosen site. If the vein selected for placement does not adequately distend, Place a second tourniquet just above the first and hang the arm below the level of the patient's heart. Wearing protective gloves, prepare the area selected for venipuncture with an applicator. Use a circular pattern starting in the center and working outward two to three inches. Allow the area a few moments to dry. Never blow dry the site. Hold the cath catheter beveled upward along a course of the vein from the peripheral to the central at about a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin. Gently pull the skin in the direction opposite that of the needle being placed with the other hand. This will facilitate entry through the skin. Forward resistance is lost once the skin is penetrated. Decrease the angle and direct it toward the vein. As soon as the needle enters the vein, blood will enter the flashback visualization chamber. Next, advance the needle just a few millimeters into the vessel. Advance the catheter hub slightly away from the needle and release the tourniquet. Continue to advance just the catheter hub three quarters of the way over the needle, but not completely off the needle. This is often referred to as hooding. Place a piece of gauze under the end of the catheter to absorb any small blood that might be lost. Hold direct pressure over the vein just proximal to the insertion site, being careful not to place it directly over the catheter. Attach a saline filled syringe to the connector Flush the IV with saline to demonstrate patency of the IV line. 
cover the site except for the connector with a sterile covering. If there was any difficulty in threading the catheter through the vein, try to continue threading the catheter while flushing with saline. This procedure often allows the catheter to pass along the inside lumen without further difficulty. Secure the connector to the arm by placing a strip of tape beneath the catheter and bring, then bring it forward, crossing over the connector and onto the skin. Secure any extension tubing to the arm with paper tape. When using any sort of extension tubing, ensure that it is rated for the power injector and then it can tolerate the flow rates and pressures created by the injector. In the venipuncture area of any materials such as packaging and applicators. Gloves are then removed and hands can be washed. Remember, not all attempts to place an IV are successful. Take it from me. Many factors can cause failure. For example, an attempt at, at a puncture can even miss the vein. At this point, the needle must be removed and properly disposed of. The bleeding at the site must be stopped and the site must be bandaged. A new vein proximal to the first attempt must be found. Veins with mul multiple punctures should be avoided because of extravasation that may occur through a prior puncture site. Now let's take a moment to watch a small video on an IV start. Notice how the indicator is showing beveled side up. Pulling the skin in the opposite direction of insertion and going parallel to the vein. Flashback chamber is indicated. Here's a close-up view. Remember the angle. You're looking at about 30 to 45 degrees. Once you've entered the vein, drop the needle down. Here's another method. Again, the flashback has been received. They're advancing the catheter just a little bit over the needle tip. Remember, this is referred to as hooding. There's the same method, but two-handed technique. Again, just a slight advancement that advances the catheter over the needle, but yet the needle still provides some rigidity to the catheter. Without the needle, the catheter has no rigidity whatsoever. Once you're done, of course, you want to make sure you minimize blood flow, applying pressure. Do not apply pressure over the catheter. That could damage the vein. This particular injector or catheter has a spring-loaded mechanism that retracts the needle. Very nice to use and dispose of it in a sharps container. Make it look easy, don't they? They secure the site with a tagoderm. You want to use what your clinical site recommends. Well, you're done with the injection and now there's a little bit of paperwork to do. Documentation is a legal necessity. There are some minimum requirements that all documentation for the administration of contrast media have. First is the name of the agent used. Did you use OptiRay or some other brand? Again, that must be clearly indicated. Often, a lot of facilities require that you put the lot number as well in case of recall. You also have to indicate the dose. How much did you use? Did you use 50 ml? Did you use 150 ml? Did the injector only inject 98 ml? Again, all of this needs to be on there. The flow rate. What did you program the injector to use? Two milliliters a second? Three milliliters a second? Again, all that needs to be indicated. The injection site. Did you use the anti-cube? The forearm? The wrist? And then lastly, any ad adverse effects and their treatment. 
did the patient have nausea or did everything was completely well tolerated? Again, all information that you want to indicate on your clinical documentation. Let's end our discussion by talking about some tips. By no means to be inclusive of all tricks out there, but just a general discussion of things that I've learned and I've seen out in the clinic. First, take your time. Make sure you find a good vein. That may mean going to the other arm. Just don't always assume that both arms are going to be the same. You can find a much easier access on another arm sometimes and save yourself a lot of grief. So take your time. Don't feel rushed. Also take time to distend the vein. Leave the tourniquet on there. Let that vein get a little bit larger. It makes establishing the IV so much easier. Of course, you want to watch patient comfort and make sure their arm isn't turning purple. But again, do allow the tourniquet to do its job. Also form a habit. For me, I found this article. Actually lay out the materials you need, perhaps in the sequence in which you need them so you won't forget something. I have made some real boo-boos, such as even forgetting to put a tourniquet on. <laughs> but again, if you establish a habit, and for me what worked was laying all the items out in sequence, I knew there was nothing that I would forget if I had everything laid out correctly. Also, you want to avoid a patient who has any kind of lymph impairment. This can occur if they've had a mastectomy or any radiation treatment on one side or the other. Avoid that side. Never recap a needle, of course, to avoid any needle sticks. Also know that if you do have a needle stick, what to do. I was actually working with a tech. We did have a needle stick situation, but nobody knew the policy. We were scrambling around, going to the ER. No one knew really what to do. It actually took almost an hour before we got somebody who was able to outline the procedure for us and what to do for that particular tech. She turned out to be okay and everything was fine. But for us, it was an eye-opening experience realizing that there really wasn't a procedure that was outlined to us. And then lastly, I recommend that you project confidence. Even if you are a novice at it, just the projection of confidence makes the patient feel calmer and actually helps you as well. You'll be surprised that just thinking that you can do it, you actually can. Again, be patient with yourself. It will take time to acquire the skill. It will take years. But you just jump in there and keep on working at it. And as always, thank you for watching.